thank you for having me here today. Thank you to uh, Retail Disrupt. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, it's actually my first time in Israel, my first time in Tel Aviv, and so I am super excited to be here. Um, only 24 hours or so, and I've already seen what an interesting, progressive, and innovative city that it is. So hopefully there's going to be a lot of interesting discussion and conversation over the next 24 hours. Um, my name is Steve Lidbury, and I am an executive principal at Hating, and I run with a team of people our studio in London. And today I'm going to talk about designing human experience and what that means and how it's relevant for the topic that we're all here for, which is what's the future of Rita? Um, I'll be doing a keynote later on this afternoon as well about the future of the workplace. And I think the interesting thing about that is the third space, really, that we can't really just think about retail work or what we do at home or hospitality. The world is very blurry. And we like to be in that kind of blurry space where we think about designing fantastic things. Um, some of you may know it, some of you may not. We've been kind of uh, considered as Apple's best kept secret for some time now. Um, we are a strategically led design and innovation business and we create integrated brand experiences. And we started probably about 30 years ago now, something like that working with Starbucks, working with Nike, and really our kind of big break is working with um, Apple. And our current founder, uh, and our founder and our current CEO, Tim Kobe, and his partner, Wilhelm Ohel, working with Steve Jobs for probably close to 20 years on defining the future vision for Apple, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. But what we believe in is how design and innovation can be a powerful tool to really progress humanity to really use it to create better human outcomes towards better business outcomes for our clients. And what we do is simply put, design meaningful experiences that aim to change the way people think, feel and do. And we do that with working with big, complex organizations, uh, with blue chip companies, but also with smaller niche players. And at the heart of our proposition, is what we call design human experience. So if I break that down a little bit, what does that mean? Well, of course we care about what design looks like. We care about the craft, we care about form, about materials, about user interface, about the uniform someone wearing. All of those things that are very visually expressive of a brand. But more importantly is underneath the skin. is how design performs, how it works how it delivers return on investment for businesses, or better NPS results. That really sits at the crux of us for design. And the second part is what we call the human elements. Now, people are incredibly interested, and we hear terms like users or consumers, and we do use those words, but that's very kind of narrow thinking. Actually, the audience is much wider than that. And we can't just think about segmentation, because in this audience, I'm sure we have Gen Z, we have millennials, exennials, and so on and so forth. But if I put you into a bucket of segmentation, you probably wouldn't be happy about that because you're going to be very different to the person next to you. You're going to have different psychographic needs. You're going to have different desires and ambitions. So we're really interested in the attitudinal qualities of people and actually what they really need and how we can build experiences around them. Not only that, we think about the staff as well. What's motivating your staff to work for you as a brand? What intrinsically motivates them to want to come and work and represent and be an ambassador for your brand? So we're very interested in the roles that staff have to play in the future of retail. And then the final part is experience. We've been designing experiences for 30 years, and it's become a bit of a buzzword of late. Um, and the truth is that a lot of people say you can't design experiences because it's a very uh, personal, internal thing. And that's true to a certain extent. But if we think about where we are now, we're in an experience. There's a physical space. There's an environment that's been created. There's communications all around that provide the narrative of where we are and what we're doing here. There are products and services that are enabling this experience, whether they're digital or whether they're human. And there's a behavior model in place. Who greeted you? Who brought you into the room? What are the different roles and responsibilities on a human level that brought it to life? And we work in this area here. We work in all four of these experience realms to connect brands 
with consumers. And as I say, we're probably most well known for Apple stores, and I could do another keynote that would last a whole hour talking about the story of Apple, um, but I won't do that. But the top line thinking is, this was so disruptive at the time. This broke all the rules of retail. This was about putting no products in the shop window, putting everything in the basement. That was unheard of. The idea of displaying phones on a wooden kitchen table was unheard of. The idea of guys selling you phones in t-shirts was unheard of, and that they weren't incentivized by sales, but by NPS results. Everything we did shifted the paradigm of retail, and that's true to what we still do today to our team in San Francisco that still works with Apple. But we work across a multitude of different sectors as well. And that's really important for us. We work in automotive, we work in hospitality, we work in airlines, banks, telecommunications. We create retail experiences for a whole multitude of sectors. And that's really important. That's what's interesting for us. And the reason it's important is because customers are themselves agnostic to category. They don't go into one bank and compare to another. They're comparing an experience they've just had with Uber or an experience they've had on an airline and the kind of service they got and they go into a bank and they're expecting a parallel service and so for us we work across all of these different sectors because it allows us to leverage all of the different types of insights and then we work what we say from pixels to products to people to peninsula it doesn't really matter about scale whether we're designing a digital product or whether we're designing a master plan or place making it's about thinking about it in the same holistic, human-centered manner. So, on to the big question, really. And if I had a dollar for every time we got asked this, I'd be a very rich man. Um, we can't predict the future, as a great man once said, but we can try and invent it. And that's what we try to do. But to create the future, we need to think about what's happening now. We need to think about the influences that are making change, the drivers. So we're seeing mass disruption everywhere, whether it's globalization that's making the world smaller and giving us more choice, the number of new technologies that are emerging that are fascinating. And when I write here about disruption, for me that's positive disruption. That's beautiful disruption. It's making us rethink the game continually. It's getting us more connected. We've got the AO generation, the always on generation, or the me generation. Everything's at the fingertips now. If I don't have it in a second, it's too late, and you're too late as a brand. But then climate change as well. It's a huge subject, and the reason I'm talking about it is because future audiences care about it, and they care about brands caring about it. Gen Zs and millennials, they want to know how a product was made. Coffee, for example. Where was it sourced? What were the condition of the workers? Is it fair trade? How was it shipped? What about the store I'm buying from? Is it energy efficient? What about the staff that are serving me? And then the paper cup that it's in. There was a huge story in the UK last year about paper cups. For years, we had been thinking we were recycling paper cups from Starbucks and Costa and so on. Actually, we weren't. The only bit that's recyclable is the sleeve. So all of those years that we were putting them in that bin, they were being taken out, separated, and they were being wasted. Wow. So that's really changed, and now they're having to look at new technologies for us. So young customers in particular care about that, and brands need to have a voice around that. And so it's leading us to this kind of world, these changing behaviors that we see. Uh, and there's a brilliant book by James Warman, which is about stuffocation. Fantastic term. It basically says we've got too much stuff. Everything. We've all got lots and lots of stuff. And really, that new pair of shoes, it'll give you that bit of happiness, but it won't change your life. Experiences are what change your life. Experiences are what really give you happiness. So we're seeing that shift to something that's more about having less. We've also seen the sharing economy emerge as well. And that's for a number of reasons. And we've seen the kind of economic crash that has happened and the reason Airbnb was so successful as a startup. It wasn't just a brilliant idea, it was brilliant timing. It was at a time when consumers' mindset changed and he wanted to think differently, and so that's why it was such a brilliant success. And we see that now. People can't afford houses, they can't afford cars, and so we've got this sharing economy model. It's about giving people access, and that's particularly relevant in the luxury market. 
And back to the point of purpose and the stop and the reference of the, um, the plastic cups. Uh, brands need to have a purpose that people can believe in. Warby Parker is a fantastic example. If I bear, buy a pair of glasses, one goes to charity. That's a powerful proposition. That's a powerful why. That's a powerful purpose for that brand. And young people love that. To the point I was just making in terms of digital, it has to be now. We start younger and younger on digital devices to the point that babies don't even know how to turn pages on a book. They just look to pitch and swipe now. It's a fantastic shift. But actually, it's always on. It needs to happen instantaneously. It needs to be connected. And ultimately, it's a shift from transactions, from purely about products to about experiences. This figure here of almost 80% of millennials wanting to spend on experiences cannot be ignored. It doesn't mean they won't buy goods. But what it means is, when we think about retail, is that we need to wrap an experience around the selling of goods in a meaningful and purposeful manner. So to the introduction, a lot of buzzwords being banded around. And actually, what's really important? And is retail dead? Well, it's not dead. It's changing. It's evolving. But traditional retail is dead. And that's what we need to be very, very careful of, is that we think in an innovative way. One example is Blockbuster, the video. I don't know if people remember that in the UK and in the US. Um, it died because it didn't innovate, because it didn't think outside of the box. It didn't understand where consumers were heading in terms of how they wanted to consume content and media. Or it did, but it didn't make the move. It didn't take the risk of moving, and it became redundant. It became irrelevant. At the same time, you had Apple making risky decisions, making smart moves. The idea of putting uh, music from an iPhone, uh, putting music from an iPod onto an iPhone to cannibalize one product actually showed success for the next 10 years. That was innovation that was happening while these guys were dying. And more recently, you know, it's a sad story. I used to go to Toys R Us all the time. But the problem is that it's not been able to remain relevant. It's been more about commerce and less about kind of creating an emotional, deep relationship with people. And it's a sorry story, but there's an opportunity. Can this ever be turned around? So we need to think more than just bricks and mortar and more than just digital. So is the future robots and AI and no humans involved anywhere? This is Amazon's warehouse. Um, or is it that innovative ideas come out of that thinking? When people are thinking about technology and thinking about how do we connect, how do we find the intersection between the physical, digital, and human touch points to create new types of experiences, new models of experiences that engage with audiences. So the future is about a few things, and we do it through our work, and I'll tell it through the lens of a couple of our projects, and of course we know about Apple. It's about spaces that you can come to with friends and family and do things. It's about more story doing as time wants to be said rather than storytelling. It's about being in the moment and building psychological bonds. It's about less vertical channel thinking and about being agnostic. Consumers are absolutely agnostic in their behavior. They're not thinking, I'm on a phone, or I'm on a call, or I'm in a space. To them, it's one journey and it's one conversation. The work we did here for Lincoln was about how do we bring a luxury product into a new market in China when BMW and Mercedes and Audi already existed. But when we understood people and their behavior, they were already 50% through the purchase funnel by the time they got to the store. They kind of knew what car, maybe what color, maybe some of the specifications. So the trick to the experience we created here was a holistic one. It was an omni-channel experience so that I can spec my car before I get there. I continue my journey when I'm in the store and continue that specification. But importantly, I have the right spatial conditions to represent the brand, and I have a series of roles that facilitate it. And the big change we did here was a shift from the typical car salesman who was incentivized by selling. We said, we're not doing it, and they thought we were crazy. But what we did was put in about six or seven new roles to bring that experience to life, to somebody who would greet you, your experienced host, to somebody who would pour you the traditional tea, a master who would talk to you about leather and craftsmanship, Someone who would talk about the engineering capabilities. All of them incentivized by passion. 
and the sales figures are phenomenal as a response. The next one to think about is community over commerce. The work here we did with Shimano was absolutely about creating a community type based experience. And what we found when we understood cyclist mentality was like being part of a tribe. And they wanted to come in and not just see bikes on display, but they wanted to engage with digital content. They wanted to come to talks and events that would bring to life the amazing engineering of the products, but also the life and the passion of what it was to be a cyclist. A side example here is um, what Levi's are doing at the moment. And when we talk about the idea of going from traditional to experimental, I'm talking about formats, I'm talking about the physical ecosystem. It's not really about how many stores you have or that there has to be closures. It's about with the stores that you have, what are you doing with them? And thinking about different formats, not just in terms of scale, but doing different things for different people in different locations based on their needs, based on kind of the shared idea. What they do is, uh, what they've done recently, is create some new products, laser etched, that's tailored to you, a very kind of semi-bespoke offering. Now they could have tested that behind the scenes and then brought it into the store, but they didn't. They've made it a live space, they've made it an experimental prototypical space, which is engaging new audiences and people love it. So these are the kind of models we need to look towards. And then finally, we need to think about retail as a space to build and deepen the relationship with your customers, to garner loyalty. The work we did for Nissan in Tokyo wasn't about a car showroom, it was about a brand experience. The targets were three to 4,000 a month, and we hit one million over four months. And that's because we created an experience that was about bringing the brand story to life through the brilliant expression of the vehicle itself through the architecture, but through it being an event space, a cafe space, a space for talks about the future of mobility, a space to engage with digital content and the kind of history of the products. So to summarize, we can talk about experience as being the future of retail. And why? Because experience is emotive. And we know when people have an emotive connection to a brand, they're more likely to buy. They're also more likely to forgive you when things goes wrong, things go wrong, and they will. But they'll also recommend you to other people. And they have that deep psychological attachment and bond that will last a lifetime. The work we did with Virgin was about differentiation. Now, oh, sorry, gone forward one. It was about, there we go, differentiation. Uh, there are many airlines. They all fly. They all have lounges. In those lounges, they all sell food. So what's the differentiating fact? It can't be about colors. It's not red or blue. The San Francisco lounge, for example, is all about this cocktail shaker. Now, he's a famous guy from the San Francisco scene. He's a mixologist. So when I go here, he'll mix my drink for me, and he'll remember you the next time you come. If I go to BA, and I have no disrespect to BA, I love BA, if anyone here from BA. Um, but there may be a gin and tonic. If I go here, he'll mix me a drink. It's a very different type of experience I'm having. And that goes for everything. That goes for being able to have a massage, have my shoes shine, have a haircut, and on and on and on. It's about the whole connected experience that really creates differentiation. And what this did was change people's behavior. It even changed my behavior. I used to start to go to the lounge two hours early, and I believe a lot of us do now, so that we can work, so that we can do things there. That's absolutely a brilliant way of, of, of building loyalty with consumers. And then experience is talk worthy. If you have amazing experiences, you talk about it. You recommend, and actually now you talk about it through your social media as well, so the reach, the amplification is so much further. And it's proven that there's a higher propensity to purchase through having experiences. So not just that, but actually give people the words that you want them to talk about. When we did the Apple store, it wasn't about creating a service station, it was the genius bar. That was the genius in it, it was calling it something proprietary and ownable that people would then say, oh, have you seen the Genius Bar? And by the way, we get asked a lot, can we do a Genius Bar? We say, no, the Genius Bar is for Apple, but what's your problem? What's, what do you need? What's your challenge? And ultimately, it's about value creation on a human level and on a business level. level. I spoke at the beginning about working towards better human outcomes, towards better business outcomes. So 600 million users worldwide worth $1 trillion. That's not all because of the work we did, of course, but it's about 
being part of that journey and creating the right types of experiences that enable this. And we call it Return and Experience. Uh, and we're, our, our founder and CEO is writing a book on it at the moment, in fact, about return on experience. But basically, in summary, it's about how if we focus on experience design in retail, we can deliver better return on investment for businesses. So back to the question of what is the future of retail. For us at 18, the future of retail is about holistic experience and considering the physical, digital and the human as one, as an intersection point for brands to really engage uh, with consumers. Thank you. Good.